Hello everyone, welcome to this lecture. The plan for this lecture is as follows. In this lecture, uh, we will introduce the definition of identification schemes which is a well known cryptographic primitive and we will see an instantiation of identification scheme namely we will see the uh, description of Snow's identification scheme based on the discrete log assumption. In the next lecture we will see that how using the fiat shamir heuristic we can convert this Snow's identification scheme into an instantiation of digital signature scheme based on the discrete log assumption. So, let us try to understand the motivation behind the identification schemes. So, again let me take an example which we which I stated during our first lecture. So, this is the well known Sundar Kant episode in Ramayana. So, uh, Ram is in uh, uh, India and he is very disappointed, he is missing mother Sita. So, he instructs his messenger that please go and pass my message to Sita that I am missing her. Uh, the, the messenger namely Han Lord Hanuman says as you wish my lord and then Ram says that since you are going to meet Sita for the first time, uh, she may ask you to prove your identity. So, you can take this ring as a proof because only Sita knows about this ring and the messenger takes the ring and he goes to Lanka and then he starts interaction with mother Sita saying that I am the messenger of Lord Ram, I have a message for you, but Sita is so scared there. So, she is not willing to believe Hanuman then she asked that how can I trust you prove your identity and Hanuman proves his identity by showing the uh, ring which Lord Ram has given to Hanuman and once Sita's mother Sita sees the ring she accepts the identity of the messenger. So, in this example the ring serves as a proof and confirms Hanuman's identity and a uh, proof right the proof the Hanuman gave is given in clear or shown in clear, but it turns out that it is extremely dangerous to show proof in clear in the current age of Kali Yuga where proof is very volatile and people may not trust each other. So, an identification scheme is a cryptographic primitive basically it is an interactive protocol between two entities which allows a prover to prove its identity in this example Hanuman to uh, without revealing the secret credentials namely the ring. So, let us go into the formal details of identification scheme and we are interested in constructing identification schemes in the public key setting. And more specifically we will focus on three round uh, commit challenge response identification schemes, but it is not necessary that your identification scheme should have uh, three rounds, but we are interested in only studying uh, identification schemes consisting of three rounds of interaction because later on we will see how we can uh, construct signature schemes from three round identification schemes. So, an identification scheme consists of uh, four protocols. So, we have a uh, key generation algorithm and we will have two algorithms P sub 1 and P sub 2 for the prover who wants to prove his identity and we will have a protocol or an algorithm for the verifier using which the verifier can verify the identity of the prover. So, the way we use an identification scheme is as follows. So, we have a prover and a verifier, the key generation algorithm will be run in this most uh, mostly by the prover and it will run the key generation algorithm to obtain a verification key and a secret key. The verification key will be available in the public domain to verify the identity of the so called prover, whereas the secret key will be available only to the prover. And using this identification scheme, the goal of the prover is to convince a verifier who is aware of the verification key that indeed prover knows the corresponding secret key SK uh, associated with this verification key VK. And the way this happens is by a three round protocol. So, during the first round prover runs the algorithm P sub 1 uh, which is a which takes input his secret key and it outputs a commitment which we denote by big I and the commitment is given to the verifier. The prover sends the commitment to the verifier and along with that the algorithm P sub 1 outputs a state information which prover keeps with itself. Now, on seeing the commitment the verifier picks a challenge which I denote by little r and this challenge is selected from a challenge space and 
the challenge is picked uniformly randomly from this challenge space and on seeing the challenge little r from the verifier the prover has to come up with a response and the response is denoted by s which is computed by running the algorithm p sub 2 which takes the secret key sk the state information and the challenge and on seeing the response the verifier has to verify whether the prover has responded correctly in response to the challenge little r with respect to the commitment big i which prover has committed at the round 1 and to verify the verifier runs the algorithm v which takes the verification key, the challenge and the response and the goal of the verifier is to verify whether the output of this algorithm v is equal to the commitment i or not. If the output matches the commitment i then we say that verifier accepts the identity of the prover that means verifier is convinced that indeed prover is the person who knows the secret key corresponding to this publicly available verification key. Whereas, if this test that the output of the algorithm v should be equal to i fails then the verifier is not convinced that uh, the prover who actually participated in this uh, protocol knows the corresponding secret key sk. So, a successful execution uh, in this uh, protocol implies that the communication happened indeed with the intended prover and not an imposter. Uh, more specifically the, we require the following two properties from an identification scheme. So, the first property is the correctness property uh, which says that for every pair of key which your key generation algorithm could output and every transcript which is generated by running an instance of the identification scheme uh, the following should hold. If the verifier runs the verification algorithm with respect to the verification key and the R and S component of the transcript it should give him the I component of the transcript that means the verification should be successful at the verifier end. So, that is the correctness property. Uh, the security property informally re requires uh, that uh, an imposter or an eavesdropper uh, who has eavesdropped an interaction between a prover and a verifier polynomial number of times should not be if should not be able to come up with an accepting transcript and successfully get it accepted at the verifier end right and this should hold if my adversary is computationally bounded so basically what it means is if the adversary has seen polynomial number of conversations between an honest prover and an honest verifier then even after seeing polynomial number of conversations in the absence uh, of the secret key sk and only with the knowledge of the verification key vk it should not be possible for that computationally bounded eavesdropper to uh, pretend as a prover and come up with an accepting conversation which gets accepted at the verifier set. So, we model this requirement this informal requirement by a security experiment. So, in this experiment uh, which we call as the identification experiment we have a computationally bounded adversary and the challenger and the description of the identification scheme is publicly known. So, the challenger uh, goes first and it runs the key generation algorithm keeps the secret key with itself and sends the verification key to the adversary. Now, what the adversary can demand is it can demand for oracle access to the transcription service. And this models the fact that in the real world uh, we could have an uh, there might be an adversary who might have seen polynomial number of interactions or polynomial number of instances of the identification scheme getting executed between an honest prover and an honest verifier. So, that adversary might have seen polynomial number of transcripts under the unknown key sk which might be available only with the prover. So, to model that we give the adversary here oracle access to the transcript service. So, to respond to this oracle access what the verifier or the, uh, what the challenger basically has to do the following. So, it knows the verification key v k uh, and it knows the secret key s k as well. So, it runs an instance of this identification scheme simulating the role of the prover and the verifier in its mind. So, basically it just runs an instance of this identification scheme as 
playing the role of the prover itself and playing the role of the verifier itself and generates the corresponding transcript IRS and that transcript is given back in response to the Oracle access service that the adversary has asked for. And since the adversary could, ha uh, could ask for Oracle access to the transcript service for polynomial number of times, every time such an Oracle access or Oracle request come, the challenger has to generate or simulate a transcript like this and give it to the adversary. Now, once the adversary is trained by seeing polynomial number of transcript, it actually interacts in a real, it tries to come up with a, a forged transcript and try to get it accepted by the challenger. So, to do that, it pretends as if it is the prover and try to come up with a transcript, so an accepted transcript without even knowing the corresponding secret SK. So, it submits a commitment which I denote by I star. In response, the challenger submits a challenge which I denote by R star and in response to the challenge, the adversary submits a response S star and this triplet I star, R star and S star is a forged transcript which adversary is trying to produce with respect uh, to this entire experiment and the definition of the experiment says that we say that adversary is able to forge a transcript which is denoted by saying that the output of this experiment is 1 if and only if the verification algorithm V when run by the challenger with respect to the verification key and the R star component and S star component of this force transcript indeed gives I star. That means I star, R star, S star constitutes a accepting transcript. And our definition of security is we say that uh, uh, an identification scheme is uh, secure if for every polytime adversary participating in this experiment, the chance that it can win the experiment is upper bounded by some negligible function. So, that is our definition of identification scheme. Now, let us see whether we can come up with an instantiation of such a scheme and there is a well known identification scheme due to SNOR. So, and it is based on the following idea. So, basically prover in this identification scheme tries to prove its identity by saying that it knows the discrete log, discrete log of a publicly known value y under the base g and to verify uh, the claim of the prover, uh, the verifier basically challenges the prover to show a random linear combination of the discrete log of y where the the random combiners for the linear combination will be selected by the verifier. So, the idea here is that indeed if prover knows the discrete log of y, then it should be able to produce a random linear combination of the discrete log of y with any other value from the corresponding uh, range of the discrete log. And this whole interaction happens is a zero knowledge fashion in the sense that throughout the interaction it will be ensured that indeed if prover knows the discrete log of y to the base g, then that discrete log is not learnt by a malicious verifier. So, <coughs> the key generation algorithm of this scheme is as follows, so it outputs a verification key and the secret key where the verification key is the description of a cyclic group of order q and a description of the generator and a random element y from the group where y is basically g to the power x, where x is selected from the set 0 to q minus 1. And the <coughs> verification key namely the discrete log of y which is x will be available with the prover, whereas the verification key namely y will be available with the verifier. So, the prover goes first in this uh, identification scheme and it commits a uh, value k selected from the set z k uh, selected from the set z q by computing g to the power k. So, that is a random value which it gives to the verifier and a challenge picked by the verifier is a random value r selected from the set z q and in response uh, to respond to the challenge basically the prover has to come up with a linear combination of the discrete log x of the y and the value k which it has selected in the round 1 and a random linear combination here is r times x plus k modulo q. And to verify whether <coughs> the response of the prover is correct or not, 
uh, verifier has to verify whether g to the power s times y to the power minus r is equal to i or not, which should actually be the case if indeed prover knows x and it has sent g to the power k during the first round. So, before going into the analysis of this identification scheme, let us see in a definition here. We say a triplet i r s where i is a group element and r s and s are elements of z q is an accepting transcript if g to the power s multiplied by y to the power minus r equal to i holds. And <coughs> the correctness property of the identification scheme or of SNOR follows from the fact that if indeed prover and verifier are honest and prover knows the discrete log of y, namely it knows x, then the transcript generated by running an instance of the SNOR identification scheme will indeed be a will indeed be an accepting transcript. So, the verification at the verifier's end will be successful. So, that proves the correctness property trivially. Now, let us try to understand the security property here. So, we first consider an eavesdropper here and imagine prover and verifier are honest and there is an eavesdropper who has monitored polynomial number of executions of this nose identification scheme. So, imagine it has eavesdropped upon one transcript which is i r s and I claim here that by seeing the transcript it does not learn anything about the secret key s k namely the discrete log of y to the base g which is x. And this is because if you see the distribution of the commitment namely big i it is independent of x because the commitment i is g to the power k where k is picked independent of x. In the same way the r component of the transcript it is completely independent of x and it is picked by the verifier. So, it also does not reveal anything about the secret x. However, if you see the value s, then the value s is r times x plus k. So, it one might feel that by seeing s the eavesdropper might learn something about x, but that is not the case here because the distribution of s is here is independent of x because the k which is used in the linear combination to compute s is independently and randomly picked by the prover and if prover is honest then the value k which is used in this linear combination will be uniformly random and unknown to the adversary. That means just by seeing s the adversary again cannot figure out anything about x. And that means an eavesdropper who sees an accepting transcript irs it will not learn anything about the underlying secret x what the adversary or the eavesdropper will learn just that the transcript irs is an accepting transcript and its distribution is independent of x. So, based on this observation we can make a very strong claim here we can say that any eavesdropper can simulate an accepting transcript based on the knowledge of verification key itself. That means it is as good as saying that even if, a, if no interaction happens between the prover and the verifier the eavesdropper well ahead could come up with a probability distribution of the transcript which it would be seeing by eavesdropping a real conversation between the prover and the verifier. And how can this be possible? Here is the way the adversary or the eavesdropper could come up with a simulated transcript on its own without even eavesdropping the conversation between the prover and the verifier. So, what the eavesdropper could do is it could randomly pick an r value and s value from z q and then once it picks the r value and s value it could see set the i value to be g to the power the s value that it has picked multiplied by y to the power minus r value that it has picked. And it turns out that if we compare the probability distribution of the real transcripts and by real transcripts I mean the transcripts which are actually generated by a real execution of this nodes identification scheme where a prover where an honest prover and an honest verifier participates in the protocol. And if we consider the probability distribution of simulated transcripts where by simulated transcripts I mean the transcripts which are generated by an eavesdropper by this method where it does not seize a real execution of the protocol, but it comes up with the values of i r s in the by the in the uh, using the method that I have discussed just now. So, if I consider the probability distributions of these two transcripts they are exactly identical. 
This means that that is why that this is because if you see the probability distribution of the R value in the real transcripts and the probability distribution of the R value in the simulated transcripts they are identical. In a real execution R will be randomly picked by Z, uh, from the set ZQ and in the simulated transcript also the R values are picked randomly from the set ZQ. In the same way in the real transcript S is going to be a uniformly random value from ZQ because K would have been chosen uniformly randomly by the prover and the same is true for the S value uh, in the simulated transcripts. And if we see the probability distribution of the I value in the real transcripts as well as in the simulated transcripts for in both the cases I is equal to G to the power S part multiplied by Y to the power minus R part of the transcripts and this is true uh, both for the real transcripts as well as for the simulated transcripts. So, if we see distribution wise the way transcripts would have been generated in a real execution of the protocol and the way transcripts are generated by the adversary in its mind without actually seeing any conversation have exactly the same distribution. And that means that just eavesdropping the communication between an honest prover and a verifier is not going to help the adversary to learn anything about the underlying secret key X. Now, here is a food for thought for you since I am claiming here that an eavesdropper could simulate and come up with an accepting transcript on its own without even knowing the secret key SK. Does that mean that using the strategy which the simulator is using or the eavesdropper is using to come up with simulated transcript, it could forge an accepting transcript and participate in an instance of uh, the Snore identification scheme and end up convincing an honest verifier that indeed it knows the X value without which is not exactly the case. And it turns out that that is not the case because uh, the reason for that is if you see the simulation strategy here the way adversary has come up with simulated transcript is it is coming it is fixing the R value and the S value to begin with right. That means it is guessing in its mind that this could be the R value or the challenge value which the verifier would pick and only when after fixing the R value and the S value it is coming up with its commitment I. So, if with this strategy it start, tries to participate in an execution of the node identification scheme with an honest verifier, then the probability that indeed he is able to come up with an accepting transcript, accepting transcript which gets accepted by the verifier is same as the challenge R tilde which the adversary is thinking well ahead in its mind matches exactly the transcript which an honest verifier is indeed going to pick up during the real execution of the Snore identification scheme. But the probability that uh, the simulated R value which adversary is guessing in its mind well ahead matches the exact value of the challenge R which is going to be picked by the verifier is 1 upon the size of ZQ set namely it is 1 upon Q and if Q is sufficiently large then this is a very small quantity it is a negligible function in the security parameter. So, that means this simulation strategy is not going to help the eavesdropper to win or forge or break this identification scheme. So, what we have proved till now is that eavesdropping is definitely not going to help the adversary to break the security of this node identification scheme. So, the only way it could attack this identification scheme is as follows without knowing the secret key is that it has to interact with a honest verifier as follows. So, it has to come up with some commitment with respect to some strategy that adversary has in its mind. And once the verifier throws a challenge, it has to come up with a, come a response S such that G to the power S into Y to the power minus R indeed equal to I. And if we want that the adversary should be able to break the security of the Snore identification scheme with high probability, then it should be the case that this adversary who is trying to break the security should be able to come up with uh, its response S irrespective of what value of R is used as the challenge by the verifier. That means, what I am to trying what I am trying to say here is that once adversary has committed some value and submitted its commitment I and if indeed that adversary is able to break the security of this identification scheme with very high probability then it does not matter what exactly is the challenge it could be R 1, it could be R 2, it could be anything. 
for any value of challenge it should be possible for the adversary to come up with the corresponding respond, response s such that g to the power s g to the power response s multiplied by y to the power challenge minus r should be equal to the commitment of the adversary. That means, once the adversary has sent submitted its commitment it does not matter whether the challenge is r 1 corresponding to the r 1 the adversary should be able to come up with s 1 such that this property or this verification is successful or it does not matter whether the verifier throws the challenge as r 2 still it should ball, it should be possible for the adversary that for the same commitment i and the challenge r 2 the adversary should be able to come up with the corresponding response s 2 such that the verification is successful at the verifier's end. Because if the adversary knows only to come up with a response for some specific values of the challenge then that is not a good adversary strategy. The probability that the adversary is able to break the security of the identification scheme is not significantly high. It is significantly high only when irrespective of what is the challenge my adversary should be able to come up with the corresponding valid response. But if you see closely here if adversary is able to come up with a successful response s i irrespective of what is the challenge value r i that means if for the same commitment i, but for different challenges r 1 and r 2 my adversary is able to come up with the corresponding uh, accepting responses s 1 and s 2. Then by solving these two equations we know that adversary actually knows how to compute the discrete log of the value y. Because if indeed uh, the commitment i and r 1 comma s 1 is a accepting transcript and so is the case for the transcript i r s 2 s 2 then it means that the discrete log of y is nothing but the product of s 1 minus s 2 and the multiplicative inverse of r 1 minus r 2. And since s 1 s 2 r 1 r 2 are all known to the adversary that means adversary actually knows to compute the discrete log of y which goes against the assumption uh, which goes against the assumption that discrete log problem is difficult to solve in my underlying group. That means if I make the assumption that discrete log problem is difficult to solve in my underlying group then it is very difficult for any adversary to respond with r 2 uh, with to respond with s 2 corresponding to the challenge r 2 as well as to respond with the response s 1 corresponding to the challenge r 1. So, now let us try to formalize this argument through a concrete security reduction proof. So, the theorem which we want to prove here is that if the discrete log problem is difficult to solve in the underlying cyclic group then this node identification scheme is secure. And assume on contrary we have an adversary who can break the security of this node identification scheme with significant probability then we can use that adversary to come up with another adversarial algorithm which can which which can win an instance of discrete log problem uh, which can solve an instance of discrete log problem with significant probability and here is how the reduction goes so the adversary which we want to construct is a d log it participates in an instance of the d log experiment where it is thrown g to the power some unknown x as a challenge and its goal is to come up with the x it invokes the adversary who can break the security of the identification scheme by setting y to be the verification scheme verification key of the identification scheme. So, now this adversary could ask for oracle access to the transcript service as per the identification scheme and this adversary d log adversary does not know the secret key sk because the secret key is x, but x is not known to this discrete log adversary. So, you might be wondering that how exactly it is possible for this d log adversary to respond to this oracle queries to the transcript service of the identification scheme. But that is possible because in the couple of slides back we had discussed that any eavesdropper could come up with a simulated transcript say i tilde r tilde s tilde whose distribution will be exactly the same as an accepting transcript which a uh, honest prover and an honest verifier would have generated by participating in a real instance of the snow identification scheme. So, what our discrete log adversary could do is in res to respond to this uh, transcript oracle services it could just come up with such simulated transcripts and respond back to the adversary. Now, once adversary is sufficiently trained it will try to come up with a 
forged transcript. So, it submits its commitment I. Then in response uh, the discrete log adversary throws a challenge R1 and it sees the response of the adversary against the identification scheme say S1. Now, what this discrete log adversary is going to do is it is going to rewind this adversary who is who can break the security of your identification scheme. Namely, it asks the adversary that you please go back two steps back to the step where you have submitted the commitment I. I now want to test you with a new challenge say R2 which is randomly chosen from the set ZQ and this adversary against the identification scheme has to now respond corresponding to the challenge R2. So, it responds with S2 and now what this discrete log adversary is going to do is it checks whether I R1 S1 is an accepting transcript namely it checks whether the first condition here holds and then it checks whether I R2 S2 is also an accepting transcript namely the second condition holds and finally, it checks whether the two challenges which it has picked randomly are different or not. Now, if all these three conditions hold simultaneously for the discrete log adversary, then it submits or it computes the discrete log of y to be the product of S1 minus S2 and the multiplicative inverse of R1 minus R2. And since R1 and R2 are different, R1 minus R2 will be not 0 and hence its multiplicative inverse modulo q will exist. Now, I claim that in this whole reduction the advantage of the discrete log solver that we have constructed namely the probability that it can solve or win the discrete log experiment is at least the square is at least uh, the square of the probability that the adversary against the identification scheme breaks the security of the identification scheme minus 1 over q. Now, if I am assuming that the discrete log assumption or the discrete log problem is difficult to solve in my underlying group, then I know that the probability in my left hand side here of the inequality is some negligible function. And if little q is also some polynomial function in the security parameter then 1 over uh, is sorry if q is actually uh, uh, if, if q is also some polynomial function in the security parameter. Uh, sorry if q is some exponential function in the security parameter then I know that 1 over q is also some negligible function. So, if my left hand side is a negligible function and 1 over q is also a negligible function then it automatically implies that the advantage of the adversary against the identification scheme also has to be negligible. So, now let us try to prove this claim formally. So, for this I introduce some notations here. So, let little omega denote the randomness used in this entire reduction except the challenge values R1, R2s which are used by the or picked by the discrete log solver. So, this little omega denotes the randomness used by the challenger in the discrete log experiment. It denotes the randomness used by the adversary against the identification scheme and it also denotes the randomness used by the discrete log solver except for the randomness used to pick up the challenges R1 and R2 in this whole experiment. Now, I know I use this quantity V of omega comma R and I say that this function V omega R is equal to 1 if corresponding to the randomness little omega and corresponding to the challenge little r the adversary against the identification scheme could come up with an accepting transcript. If that is the case then I say that output of this function v omega r is 1 otherwise it is 0. And with respect to a fixed randomness omega this quantity delta sub omega is defined to be the probability that uh, the output of the function v with respect to the fixed randomness omega over all possible challenge randomness r is equal to 1. Right, so, that is why quantity uh, delta sub omega. So, it is basically the probability of this identification adversary against the identification scheme coming up with an accepting transcript with respect to a fixed randomness little omega over all possible challenge randomness little r. And then let me uh, call this function delta of n to be the probability with which this adversary against the identification scheme can uh, win the security game against the identification scheme in this reduction. 
So, as per our this note as per our notations that we have introduced till now this delta of n is nothing but probability over all uh, randomness little omega used in this entire reduction and the probability over all challenge randomness little r the probability that v of w of r comma uh, w omega comma r is equal to 1 and if we expand it further it is nothing but the summation over all the randomness little omega that what is the probability that omega is the randomness used in this entire experiment entire reduction except for the challenge randomness and with respect to that fixed randomness little omega uh, what is the probability that uh, uh, delta sub uh, omega equal to uh, delta sub, what is the probability of uh, delta sub omega. So, that is a infinite that that is a that is a way we can expand our function delta of n. Now, if we see this entire reduction our discrete log solver can successfully extract out the discrete log little x only if these three conditions hold namely i r 1 s 1 is an accepting transcript and i r 2 s 2 is an accepting transcript and the challenges r 1 and r 2 are different where the challenges r 1 and r 2 are randomly chosen by the discrete log solver right. So, we can formally state that the probability that our discrete log solver can solve the discrete log is the probability that if we take the probability over all randomness little omega and all challenge randomness r 1 and r 2 v of w of r 1 is equal to 1 this captures the fact that i r s i s r 1 s 1 should be an accepting transcript and v of omega r 2 should be 1 this captures the fact that i r 2 s 2 should be an accepting transcript and r 1 should be different from r 2 this captures the third condition right. So, now what we have to do is basically we have to just expand this probability expressions because these probabilities are overall candidate uh, randomness little omega challenge randomness r 1 and challenge randomness r 2. So, by using the rules of probability if I take or if I solve then uh, this quantity r 1 not equal to r 2 I can replace by the probability that r 1 uh, uh, I can take this probability of omega and r 1 and r 2 inside and then I can substitute it uh, this and condition by this subtraction condition. And what I can do is I know that this thing that probability that my challenge randomness r 1 and r 2 are different is 1 over q because both r 1 and r 2 are picked randomly from the set z q. And now what I can do is I can expand this first quantity and the second quantity with respect to r 1 and r 2 and fix set omegas. And once I fix omega uh, these two events that v of w comma r 1 should be 1 and v of w comma r 2 should be 1 they are independent of each other because r 1 and r 2 are picked independently by the discrete log solver. So, if I fix the omega and the randomness omega and take the omega inside and try to expand with respect to the randomness r 1 and r 2 uh, the inequality here then basically I get that uh, this in the above inequality turns out to this thing. And now I can apply the well known Jensen's inequality which I am not stating here you can use any standard reference to find out the formula for Jensen's equality. What I can do is uh, I can take the square here inside the expression that probability of randomness omega to happen here. And if you now see that uh, this entire big bracket here the square of this big bracket is nothing but uh, delta of n that is what is the definition of delta of n and delta of n is nothing but the probability with which the adversary against the identification scheme can win the uh, game here in the reduction right and that is what is the claim which we wanted to prove. We have proved that the advantage of the discrete log solver here is greater than equal to the square of the advantage of the uh, adversary against the identification scheme minus 1 over q if q is some exponential function in the security parameter then it is 1 over q is negligible and uh, as per the assumption the disadvantage of the discrete log solver should be some negligible function that proves that the square of the advantage of the adversary against the identification scheme also should be negligible. So, that brings me to the end of this lecture <coughs> just to summarize uh, in this lecture we have introduced uh, identification scheme which is which is a well known uh, crypt which is a well known cryptographic primitive 
and we have seen an instantiation of identification scheme based on discrete log assumption namely the SNOR identification scheme. Thank you.